Let's generate our motivation. So when we engage with the Dharma, there's different ways of engaging. We can engage with it uh, intellectually, hearing teachings, knowing the four of this, the seven of that, the twenty-two of the other thing, knowing all the definitions and so on. And that's really useful. But it doesn't necessarily change our mind. Or we can engage with it uh, on a meditative level, meditating a lot. But if we haven't studied, then we don't really know how to meditate properly and what to meditate on. And yet if we only study, then we don't have any experience. So we have to put these two things together with a third element, which is kind of the devotional practices chanting, offering, prostrations, and so forth. And so how do we become like a well-rounded practitioner who knows the Dharma, but uses it to change their mind, and because of that has great devotion to the Three Jewels, makes offerings, bows, and so on. And then, of course, there's the element of putting it into practice in our daily life, too, getting off the cushion and acting with conviction on what we've learned in the Buddha's words. So there's lots of different aspects that are required to really become a well-rounded person in the Dharma. And, of course, the balance between all these uh, elements changes all the time. And so we never succeed at finding the balance and staying there. But over time, we learn how to work with our mind and have a sense of what we need to do at any specific moment to keep our mind engaged with the Dharma. So generating bodhicitta is one part of that. We have to learn on an intellectual level what it is, the definitions, the divisions. We have to know the steps of how to generate bodhicitta and practice them and make some headway such that our mind changes. And then to live bodhicitta in our life as best as we can and have whatever knowledge and experience we have of bodhicitta. 
deepen our trust and confidence and faith in the three jewels. Let's do our best to do that. And even if it's artificial bodhicitta, that's good enough. Because implanting it in our mind again and again and again will eventually lead to uncontrived experience. So holding all sentient beings in our mind with compassion. Let's strive to attain full awakening for their benefit. So we're in the middle of the chapter about karma, talking about applying it to current ethical issues. But before we do that, I want to clarify some things according to some questions that people have been asking me in the last week and discussions that I've had with people. And uh, so this, as I explain it, you'll see that sometimes... I don't use the correct words to explain things. Yeah. So, for example, when we purify, okay, what we're purifying are the karmic seeds. We're not purifying the afflictions. Okay. We're purifying the karmic seeds that, when they ripen, will throw us into a rebirth or determine different aspects about our life. Okay, so when we're doing Vajrasattva, we're not purifying afflictions, we're purifying karmic seeds. But through doing the practice, we're reducing the strength of the afflictions. Okay? We don't really... Uh, eliminate the uh, karmic seeds from our mind stream until uh, we realize emptiness directly. Before that, our purification is uh, cutting the strength of the uh, results that those seeds could bring. So making the results not last as long or be as intense, or occur so frequently, or occur immediately rather than later on. Okay, so when we're purifying karma, that's how uh, our, the purification affects the karma. Only the realization of direct realization of emptiness purifies the karma in the sense of removing it from the mind stream altogether. Okay, Uh, now what happens to virtuous karma that we committed as ordinary beings that uh, is polluted virtuous karma because it was created under the influence of ignorance? I've asked that question a few times about what happens to it and I haven't gotten a really clear answer. Okay, it can't just diminish, I mean, go out of existence because it's virtuous, so it, you know, helped us to get where we're going once we get on the path. 
On the other hand, if it wasn't created with the realization of emptiness in the mind, then it's, you know, it's polluted. So I will continue to ask various people about that and see if I can come up with a good answer. Okay. Afflictions, while while karmic seeds are purified, afflictions, um, the strength of them is reduced, and then we begin to abandon afflictions. Okay? So we don't purify afflictions, we abandon afflictions. There's two levels of abandonment. When we... uh, are practicing uh, shamatha or serenity, yeah, and finally uh, attain one of the stages of dhyana. The uh, some of the coarse afflictions are suppressed. Okay, they aren't totally abandoned; they're suppressed. But in the text, it says they're abandoned. So don't get confused, because when you're studying about serenity and they say the afflictions are abandoned when you attain different degrees of dhyana and so forth, it doesn't mean completely abandoned. It means suppressed. Okay? The afflictions are abandoned. Okay? The um, uh, acquired afflictions are abandoned on the path of seeing. And the uh, innate afflictions are abandoned on the path of meditation. And then bodhisattvas um, abandon, so, uh, abandon the uh, cognitive obscurations on the three pure bhumis, the eighth, ninth, and tenth. Okay. Also, when we talk about objects of abandonment, there's two, objects abandoned by reasoning and objects abandoned by uh, the path. So objects abandoned by reasoning are, for example, inherent existence, which never existed and never will exist, but we you know, uh, banish it from the mind uh, through using reasoning to prove to ourselves that inherent existence is non-existence, non-existent. Okay. Then things abandoned by the path, yeah, those are the afflictive obscurations and the cognitive obscurations. So the karma, I mean, the afflictions are abandoned by the path. The subtle dualistic view and the latencies of the afflictions are abandoned by the path. Okay, they're the cognitive obscurations. So two two levels of abandonment when we talk about afflictions and two things that we abandon. Abandonment uh, by the path and abandonment by reasoning. Okay. Then, okay, um, when we talk about obscurations, yeah, the afflictive obscurations are ignorance, all the uh, uh, afflictions, be they uh, acquired ones or innate ones, and their seeds, okay, so the seeds of the afflictions. Karma, karmic seeds are not part of uh, the afflictive obscurations. Now, when we talk about uh, the second truth, the origins of suffering, there we have ignorance, afflictions, and karmic seeds. Although we often just say karma instead of karmic seeds. Yeah. So also don't get confused when you hear people say karma, it often means karmic seeds. And sometimes they, people say karma when it means the result, too. So you have to tell from the, the, the context. But by definition, karma is referring to all 
the intention and what is created, okay, the causal part of it. So, um, so when we talk about the second of the four truths, ignorance, afflictions, and karmic seeds, when we talked about the afflictive obscurations, ignorance and afflictions, and the seeds of karma, the seeds, I mean, the seeds of the afflictions. Okay, let's, let's try this over again. When we talk about the second noble truth, ignorance, afflictions, seeds of the afflictions, and karma, or karmic seeds. Okay, that's the second noble truth. Yeah, that is to be abandoned or overcome. In terms of um, the affliction, the afflictive obscurations, karmic seeds are not an afflictive obscuration. There you have ignorance, karma, and the seeds, uh, I mean ignorance, afflictions, and the seeds of the afflictions. Okay, that's where the afflictive obscurations. Then there's the word transform that we like to use in the West. And uh, often we hear uh, that we transform afflictions on the tantric path. Yeah, we hear about, you know, you transform anger into the path, you transform attachment into the path. When I said that one time with uh, Geshe Dadal, he corrected me and he said, we do not transform the afflictions in the path. Those afflictions have to be abandoned. What we do is we take them into the path to generate the three Buddha bodies, but we don't transform them so they become part of the path. Okay, so declare a five what the meaning of transform means. And then the Venerable Sangha Kadra and I have been talking about the use of transform when we talk about cause and result. Yeah, because uh, as I've learned it, the cause ceases and the, and the result arises so that the cause and result don't exist at the same time. When we say the cause ceases, it just means that moment of the cause ceased. It doesn't mean that the cause doesn't bring the, a result. Because if it didn't bring a result, it wouldn't be called a cause. Okay, But the point is that the cause and the result cannot exist at the same time. The cause ceases, in the next moment, the result arises. Of course, when you get down to the nitty-gritty of it, can you draw a line and say, on this side of the line, it's a seed. On that side of the line, it's a sprout. And here is exactly the moment where the seed becomes the sprout. Yeah, You can't do that. Yeah, because all this whole process is occurring conventionally. And conventional words are just approximations. They aren't the actual thing that is going on. Okay. So you can't draw the line. But you can sure talk about it. Just like my, you know, I tell you when I was standing in the middle of the Negev desert and there's the fence there and where does Israel stop and where does Jordan begin? You know, which grain of sand? Because there's got to be two grains of sand next to each other. And somehow one is in Israel, one is in Jordan. Yeah. Can you find that space? And those two grains of sand along a whole long border and say, that's where it is? No. You know, it's just kind of a, they have a no man's land in between. Yeah. 
Now, whose land is the no man's land? Is it, does it belong half to Israel and half to Jordan? I don't know. Okay. But, um, yeah, the point here is that the cause and effect do not exist at the same time. Okay. And uh, Dharmakirti went into that a lot, didn't he, in Pramnavartika? Okay. So um, I hope that clears, of, clears up some terminology. If karmic seeds are purified by the wisdom realizing emptiness, then why does an arhat still have karma that hasn't that hasn't been eliminated? Because it's it's not all karmic seeds that are purified. Um, I don't know. Do the Mahayana say that the that the arhats experience suffering? The Pali tradition. They don't does. have suffering. But they still have karmic seeds. They have karmic seeds. I think so. I'll check. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what the Mahayana. I can't remember. It's probably in volume three somewhere. Um, but uh, the Tara, the Pali tradition says that they still have the seeds of negative karma. But what has been stopped is the seeds uh, that produce rebirth and samsara. And the way the Pali tradition says those karmas have been stopped is because there's no more craving and clinging, the eighth and ninth links, that could make it ripen. That's what Brahma teaches. Yeah. Karmic seeds, there's no craving. Yeah. Hmm? No craving that would ripen. Yeah, yeah, there's no craving that would make the karmic seeds ripen. Okay, but um, I mean, definitely the seeds of destructive actions would be purified, um, you know, by the realization of emptiness. Not all at once. Yeah, there's probably different stages in that. And I don't know how it would be different, purified for the... um, for the shravakas and and solitary realizers versus for the bodhisattvas. There's going to be a difference because they say that uh, bodhisattvas, Arya bodhisattvas, do not experience physical pain um, because of their wisdom and, no, because of their merit, and they don't experience mental pain because of their wisdom. So somehow, you know, and because a bodhisattva has so much more merit, so the purification process has got to somehow be different. Yeah. Um, But in purifying negativity, you know, uh, the seeds of negative karmas, you know, maybe in some way, you know what they talk about it sometimes being the seeds being removed from the mind the mind stream completely but then other times it seems like they still may have the seeds of certain karmas but they don't experience suffering as a result that karma can still ripen but they don't experience suffering and definitely in the uh, mahayana tradition we talk so much about karmic connections with people. And that's given us the whole reason why we have to become Buddhas instead of relying on all the infinite Buddhas that already exist, because we have our own unique set of karmic connections with different people who we can benefit better than other Buddhas can because of those karmic connections. So obviously, that kind of meaning of, you know, karma connection, which I've never seen a total, a complete uh, definition of it. A lot of these things, I mean, for all the emphasis they put on definitions, there's a lot of things that are talked about where you cannot find a definition, okay? So, uh, 
you know, on this one, what a, I've never seen a definition of a karmic connection. But obviously, it's something that works and it benefits sentient beings. Yeah, so some process of habituation or whatever, closeness. But that does not mean that we have soulmates. Okay? <laughs> one, one of my friends, uh, you know, so into the Dharma and a lot of retreats and stuff like that. We talked about Dharma a lot. And then he fell in love. And then he told me, you know, I have a soulmate now. <laughs> I said, what? You know, <laughs> um, uh, you know, because you see how easily the mind goes, down, goes into grasping inherent existence. This person has an unchangeable personality. I have an unchangeable personality. And we are linked up over lifetimes, you know. But I don't think that's really the way it is. Although there is a sutra in the Pali Canon where a husband and wife tell the Buddha that they want to be connected. They want to be husband and wife in a future life because they get along so well and they care about each other so well. So the Buddha told them how to do that and make the prayers and, and so on to do that. But it's not something that... Uh, uh, the Buddha did a lot, and he certainly uh, didn't advertise being a, uh, a, um, a yeah, a, 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 a matchmaker from one life to the next. <laughs> okay. Who, the Buddha's wife? Oh, he might have. Sometimes in the Jataka tales, it's very interesting how Thing, you know, people in different tales are matched up. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the Jataka tales, the, the way I interpret them is they were, they're very good tales for teaching about karma and teaching about, um, about kindness and about ethical conduct. But I don't take everything in the Jataka tales, literally. Yeah? Um, you know, like I wouldn't say that, you know, the Buddha and Yashadara were married from beginningless time in all their lifetimes. I don't think that would be correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay, shall we go on to other discussable topics? That I'm sure people will have. Okay. Yes. I'll be really honest. The idea of this karmic connection thing with holy beings really supports my attachment. Mm -hmm. You know, so I really like that. But at the same time, a Buddha has skillful means. Yeah. And so they, they can connect with anyone. So on what side of the equation is this karmic connection? Yeah. I think it's, it's kind of on both sides. You know, it's on the disciple's side, it's on the, the teacher's side. You know, you were together in the past, you created merit together, so there's some tendency to, you know, meet in a future life and create merit together, something like that. Like I said, I have not seen a definition of it, nor have I seen a, uh, an explanation of exactly what it is. But people talk about it all the time. Okay? So exactly how it works, I can't give you that, that level of detail. Okay? Okay. So we talked about scientific research last time, right? And uh, now genetic engineering. But I want to read the last paragraph in the, in, under scientific research, because I think it's important. So it's the top of 261. People often assume what is best for the economy 
earns more income for their company, secures more political power, results in fame, or increases military might is most beneficial. Okay? These are not valid criteria for determining benefit. Yeah? So here we're talking in terms of what scientists should uh, research, but I think also what people should put their energy into doing. Okay? Because those goals are short-sighted and biased, and adhering, adhering to them could easily bring us as individuals and as members of the human species, more suffering. We must consider that each and every sentient being wants happiness and freedom from suffering. Yeah, and that should be the bottom line. When, you know, if you have a really compassionate uh, government, that is going to be the bottom line, you know. How do you give the most people happiness and prevent the most people from suffering? And not just people, also the animals. Okay, now genetic engineering. In one sense, genetic engineering resembles already accepted procedures. Kidney, heart, and liver transplants are now common practice, and patients benefit tremendously from these. By extension, scientists could conceivably alter certain genic, genetic components that are instrumental in causing diseases. Okay, so not just, uh, you know, what you call it, um, transplanting organs, but transplanting genetic material. Okay, so much caution and forethought of all the implications are required, however, just as a high degree of knowledge about possible outcomes of an organ transplant and ways to counteract damaging side effects is necessary before transplanting an organ. Such forethought regarding the benefits and the by byproducts of genetic engineering is necessary before proceeding uh, with this research. Okay, in other words, rather than just saying, wow, what a far out thing of doing, you know, we could create whole new species, whole new different kind of beings, mix some genetic material from this and that, and we can stop different diseases and we can stop birth defects. And we can also create new birth defects and new illnesses by playing around with genetic material, okay? But sometimes the thrill of some new uh, opportunity to discover something that we don't know anything about yet, you know, like the scientists who want to, you know, split the atom, then it's the same thing here. We just are so curious how this works. Let's get to work and figure this out. You know, it needs a lot of forethought about what possible effects are going to be. Yeah. In the same way, you know, they're talking about a vaccine for COVID and, you know, rushing things out into production. But if you haven't done enough testing, something may seem to cure COVID, but 10, 20 years down the line, cause some other disease or COVID coming back or who knows what, yeah? So there's a lot of responsibility whenever scientists are doing things to, to really think long distance, um, you know, about what's going to be beneficial. On the other hand, when you're in the middle of a pandemic, you do want to get something that works out quickly. So it's a difficult developing, you know, balancing act. Yeah. And I admire the people who are volunteering for these studies to be human guinea pigs, but I'm not going to do that. You know, but some people, yeah, 
I mean, they could be doing it for a very compassionate reason. I can't judge. Okay. This fourth thought involves not just a few people, such as a governmental commission or a committee of scientists, because a lot of people, you know, with lobbyists, you know, you lobby for different kind of genetic engineering and somebody else asks for something else and the motivations are all to make money. Yeah. But all of us need to be involved in this discussion because genetic manipulation can potentially have an enormous effect on living beings. What could be the long-term effect on our bodies of eating genetically altered food? Yeah. What could be the political, economic, social, and ethical, ethical ramifications of creating genetically designed children? Or genetically designed crops? How is that going to affect the world economy? How is that going to affect who's a rich nation and who's a poor nation? Okay. Um, what could be the political econom... Okay, I said, as a human community, we must discuss these questions and make wise decisions together. Okay, then, embryos from in vitro fertilization. How to handle extra embryos after in vitro fertilization? has to do with how we define life. From a Buddhist viewpoint, sentient life, as distinct from mere biological life, involves the presence of consciousness. So something can be biologically, biologically alive, but not be a living being with consciousness. Okay? Plants are biologically alive, but they don't, they are not sentient beings. Okay. But when does consciousness enter the body? Most Buddhist texts agree that consciousness joins with the fertilized egg. Okay, so first the 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 two components come together. Yeah. Um, the sperm and the egg come together. But the texts don't specify if that occurs before or after the fertilized egg is implanted in the womb. So some texts say that the sperm enters into, I mean, the consciousness enters into the father, joins with the sperm, then connects with the, the egg and the, you know, the fertilized egg. I don't know if everybody says that. Some people say that that happens. Okay, but then if it, you know, if first the, the egg is fertilized, yeah, when does the consciousness enter? At the time of fertilization or at the time that the fertilized egg implants in the womb? Because His Holiness was very curious when he met with scientists. If there's a lot of fertilized eggs that don't implant in the womb. And the scientists said yes, that not all fertilized eggs actually make it to become human beings. Some of them just flush out. They, they don't, you know, aren't embedded in the lining of the womb. Okay. So, however, once the sperm, egg, and consciousness are together, Whenever that is, we're not sure, before or after implantation, and the cells start to multiply in the womb, a sentient being exists. We do not know if consciousness joins with an egg during in vitro fertilization before it has been put in the womb. Because the egg, the egg can be fertilized in vitro, but without the, we don't know if the consciousness enters at that point or after. 
that is in, put into the mother's womb, and then some of the fertilized eggs attach to the womb and grow into babies, and other ones don't. Just because you have a fertilized in vitro egg doesn't mean it's gonna, you're going to have a baby. And sometimes, you, so they usually put in more, uh, more eggs just, you know, because a certain percentage of them they think will, will not become babies. Uh, but it's an interesting question because if, uh, and we'll come to it here, if the consciousness has entered before that, yeah, uh, then, you know, I mean, that living being has a very f short lifespan if the egg, the fertilized egg isn't implanted in the mother afterwards. But what about when some people have their f the fertilized eggs frozen? Some people have the unfertilized eggs frozen and some the fertilized eggs frozen. So those beings, if the consciousness has entered at that point, are they very cold? Because the eggs are frozen. And if uh, somebody later decides, well, they're not going to use those eggs and discard them, is that killing a sentient being? You know, th there's some pretty difficult questions. I know one couple that, that had in vitro uh, fertilization and um, how many was it? She wound up having two kids, but I think there were like three or four, maybe even five, that started growing in the womb. And she was small and there was no way she could, you know, give birth to all five kids and live. And it was torture for them to, uh, you know, sign the paper saying that they can extract, you know, abort three of, of the fertilized eggs. Yeah. Because they felt very strongly, you know, th these, are, these are our kids and how can we take them out? But, the, you know, the, she couldn't carry a, 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 that size pregnancy at all. So really difficult for them. So according to uh, Pampers.com, I'm not sure if this is the most, that's a diaper company. Um, they're saying that um, when you have identical twins, uh -huh. um, so there's one sperm and egg that are, right. that's fertilized and then it splits. Right. And then later it burrows into the uterus. So um, if there's, Two basically that means there's two consciousnesses. Yeah. So when did it... they enter? You know, at the times the the cell split, or did they enter both together into the fertilized egg at the same time? Okay. So much discussion revolves around what to do with the excess fertilized eggs after in vitro fertilization that enables a childless, childless couple, or even a, a couple that has kids, but they want more, to have a child. Should those fertilized eggs be used for stem cell research? Should they be discarded, given to another couple who wants to have a child? Kept, very, kept indefinitely at a very low temperature. If those eggs have consciousness, do those sentient beings suffer from cold? These, are quest these questions are difficult to answer. I encourage doctors as well as couples to contemplate these issues before having in vitro fertilization so that they do not suffer from confusion if faced with this situation. Yeah. Because they, like I said, they usually, the couple wants to have one kid, they may put in half a dozen fertilized eggs, yeah. thinking that it's good if one of them, you know, turns into a baby. 
But in some case, it might be two or three or four or five or six that turn into babies. Difficult. Okay, stem cell research. Research on stem cells harvested from human embryos could potentially bring cures for diseases and new ways to heal injuries. Genetic research could include tests to see if embryos had genetic defects that could later lead to debilitating diseases. But what is the effect of such research on the beings who inhabit those embryos? What kind of karma is created by doing this research? Will the knowledge derived from it bring happiness or may it create more misery and confusion? So we need to investigate these issues and make wise decisions. Yeah. Because, you know, if there's consciousness in that, those beings don't have a chance to vote on what happens to their body. Yeah. But this is, uh, you know, and this is the argument used against abortion. Okay is that something is being done to somebody else's body and they don't have a say-so in it. Some people accept that insects and animals have some form of sentience, but believe that since human beings have greater intellectual capacity, they are superior. Others say that all sentient beings are similar in wanting happiness and not wanting suffering, And thus, it is unsuitable for human beings to use animals for scientific research. Is it beneficial to harm some beings in order to devise ways of helping others? Okay, the Nazis thought it was, and they used human beings on experiments. Yeah, and uh, certain American doctors with eugenics, also used human beings on experiments. Yeah. And even uh, right after the Second World War with the Tuskegee, Tuskegee, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it was a platoon or, you know, the, the group of soldiers, Uh, They were taken uh, for a scientific experiment, but they were not taught what the, the, uh, (laughs) explain what the experiment was about. And so they were infected with um, uh, with, um, sexual, syphilis, syphilis, yeah. I was gonna say sexually transmitted disease. It was syphilis specifically. And, And they didn't receive treatment because American doctors wanted to see what happened long term if somebody had syphilis. And I think they gave a control group drugs, didn't they? You don't know? Okay. Anyway, you know, so is it beneficial to harm some beings in order to devise ways of helping others? Unfortunately, we cannot ask the beings in the embryos or in the animal bodies if they agree to offer their lives for the potential benefit of others. Yeah, all the mice, all the monkeys, rabbits, all all sorts of living beings, you know. And the same goes for when people eat meat. They don't ask, are are you willing to give your life so I can have lunch? Nobody asks the fish and the the cattle and the chickens. Okay, cloning. Similar considerations about the presence of consciousness uh, uh, affect the issue of therapeutic cloning, in which... Uh, scientists create a new human body with the same genes as the original person such that the clone's organs could be harvested 
and transplanted into the cloner, the original person, okay? But Dolly, the clone sheep, she was the first one, remember, was a different sentient being with a different mind stream than her cloner. In the case of human beings, I don't think the clone would agree to donate his or her organs to the cloner or vice versa. Could you imagine you clone a sentient being who's genetically like you, has a consciousness, scientists don't know what having a consciousness means, you know, and then do you now, does that clone now become your legal possession so that you can control what that other person does so that they don't get injured so that all their body organs remain healthy, so that if you need one of them, you can uh, harvest it from their body, and they don't have any say-so in it. Okay? Unless we consider various ramifications and make wise, thoughtful decisions, we may become so enamored with science and technology that in the pursuit of happiness, we create more problems and more suffering. Okay, birth control and abortion. Now people are going to get revved up. But somebody has a question first. We have quite a few questions. Um, but also just a comment. There, there has a, been a, there's a movie made about that exact situation called Never Let Me Go which was back in 2010, where they had, they cloned humans that were to be harvested for their counterparts. And it plays it out where it's like, these are actually living beings with their own feelings and thoughts yeah. and love affairs and blah, blah, blah. And to see how it, how inhumane that would be for yeah. that to happen. It's quite, it's a very well done movie based on, I think, a Japanese book. Um, but are some questions that relate there's quite a few. Um, let me find. Um, so someone is asking, um, does being brain dead mean a body is no longer considered a sentient being? So my mother asked me to be the one who decides who pulls the plug. And her directive is only to do that if she is brain dead. So this person really doesn't want to kill their mother. So please... Um, where to tell, please tell me, she asked, where this falls in terms of the Dharma. Yeah. This again is quite difficult because we don't know exactly when the consciousness leaves the body. Okay? Because we have brain death, we have heart death, we have the breathing stopping. You know, when does the consciousness leave the body? And especially, if you take, uh, you know, if you have knowledge of, of the idea of the very subtle consciousness and the gross consciousness is absorbing gradually and that the subtle, con- subtle and subtlest consciousnesses can still be in the body without the uh, breath or the heartbeat. And I think with probably without the brain too for the subtlest consciousness. So, yeah, yeah. When I said without the brain, I meant brain activity. I didn't mean that you take the brain out. Um, Okay, so, you know, that again is very, very difficult to pin down exactly when death occurs. Yeah, I think, you know, when if a relative is, is putting out their advanced directive, Um, you know, the person, if they're asking a specific person to carry that out, that person should feel comfortable doing it. The advanced directive should uh, go with the hospital and the doctor that usually treats the person, but it may be good to carry it on you all the time if you travel a lot, because you could be somewhere else when you die, 
and you want, uh, you know, your choices to be known. Okay. And some other question? Yeah. Okay. Um, someone asks, would you suggest to aspiring parents to choose adoption over in vitro fertilization, or even choose adoption over normal procreation, since there are already so many kids needing a good home? It's, um, I can tell you my own personal bias, but I cannot tell you, give you an objective answer that applies to everybody. Okay? Uh, my own personal bias, and that's clearly what it is, is uh, I would favor adoption. Okay? Why? Because my little sister is adopted. Okay, and uh, parents had me and my brother, and then my mom had cancer and so couldn't have any more kids after that. And uh, I always wanted a little sister, so I pestered. I whined. <laughs> I nagged. Yeah, and, uh, and so one day we got a phone call that... This woman had just had a baby and was putting it up for adoption, and did we want it? And we had a family conference. Everybody said yes. We did not have one diaper, one baby bottle, one crib, nothing for babies in the house. And in two days, we brought her home. And I love my little sister. And I'm so glad that, you know, she was put up for adoption and, uh, and was able to come, you know, she's definitely part of the family. It's, you know, there's no separation there at all. So that, that is my personal, yeah, partial, biased opinion, <laughs> okay? But uh, every, you know, people have different ideas and different needs and different feelings. And so people will have to make up their own minds about that. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine I used to work with was in this situation where her husband got, I don't know, Hodgkin's lymphoma or something. And they had to radiate him, which was going to sterilize him. So they banked a lot of sperm beforehand. And at that point, uh, they wanted more kids. They had one boy, and she had five more sons in that one pregnancy. So her family went from one child to six children in two pregnancies. And they all made it. All five kids made it. But, and I saw her after she had these kids, and I never really saw her again after that, but it was a friend of mine at work that had tr triplets, and they stayed in contact, so I heard about her. But... When I did go visit her, she said that she felt like a cow. <laughs> and her mother came to live with her. And she said, and she was very Christian. And she said, be careful what you pray for. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, and she quit working. And her husband was a physical therapist. They were both physical therapists. Yeah. Her husband, I know, kept working. And um, they had to change a lot of things in their lives. Oh, I think yeah. the main thing I would say is if you do that, you have to get ready for really big changes. You know, I mean, it was huge. Yeah. And they couldn't manage it, which just the two of them. It was, mm -hmm. It's way too much work. Mm -hmm. There's a few questions about your talk about karma at the beginning. Should I do okay. that now? Yeah. Okay. Um, one person said, I'm becoming more and more disgusted with Trump, and I'm getting so much, I'm getting so angry that I'm worried about how it's affecting my karma. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people in that situation. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, I have to deal with that sometimes too. And the way I deal with it is okay, there's a few different things. One is, I created the karma to be here at this time in this society with this going on. So I didn't create Trump, but I created the karma to be, you know, in America when this is going on and having to 
live through it. So that part I cannot blame on anybody else. Okay, I created that karma to be here. Trump, okay, one of my favorite things when I get angry at him is um, just thinking that of him when he was a baby and thinking, you know, the babies are cute and also thinking that he is a product of his past lives and the way, you know, he was brought up. And then I think, what would happen? How would I have turned out if I had been the daughter of Fred and Marianne Trump? Yeah? If I, you know, if I was, had the same parents as him, with that kind of father, that kind of mother, that kind of socioeconomic class, that kind of schooling and conditioning. Yeah. How would I have turned out as a human being? You know, it's, that shuts down the arrogance because uh, I can't say that that kind of upbringing would not have detrimentally influenced me. Yeah, it, it could have influenced me a lot. And had he been born, you know, been brought up in a different kind of family, in a different socioeconomic class, he would be a different person too. So it it reminds me that, you know, there aren't, again, solid, inherently existent people with fixed characteristics. Yeah? So that helps me a lot to, to think of the situation. And then when I think, too, of the, um, his future lives, it's like then you have to have compassion for somebody who's creating the karma to have quite a few hellish rebirths. Yeah? So rather than be angry, have some compassion for that person. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) And someone else asks, if karmic seeds don't ripen into suffering or happiness, are they still seeds if they have no potential to do anything? Um, You can have neutral karma that ripens into neutral situations. Okay, because there's virtuous, non-virtuous, and neither virtuous nor non-virtuous karma. Okay. Usually the neutral karma isn't strong enough to, uh, to throw a rebirth. But it might influence, you know, certain things in your environment or, or so on like that. Someone else asks, if in this life we cultivate wisdom and practice together, Will we be able to meet next life again and again to continue practicing? Sometimes I wonder what brings us together. That's a statement. Uh, No, it was a question. If in this life we cultivate wisdom and practice together, will we be able to meet again next life and practice again and again? Well, there's the karma connection, so that's possible. But there's also a lot of other factors that play in the equation that need to be present for that to happen. It isn't that you create one karma and one karma brings one result without depending on any other causes or conditions. That's not the way it is. There's, you know, maybe one principal karma and then tons of other karma that ripen. And then in that very lifetime, there's all these causes and conditions, too. So things, you know, it's very, very complex. So birth control and abortion. The presence of consciousness in a zygote also affects decisions regarding birth control and abortion. 
Birth control that inhibits the fertilization of the egg is fine. Yeah. So uh, I learned um, by the wrong way because in one book I, I was wrote uh, I wrote about the day after pill. Yeah, and I was saying the day after pill the consciousness is there, so that would be like killing. And somebody wrote to me and said, no, the, the, um, with the day after pill, the sperm and the egg have not conjoined. The egg is not fertilized yet. Yeah? So it's not uh, comparable to abortion. So abortion uh, opponents, it's good if you know, they have that kind of information. Um, okay, so birth control that inhibits the fertilization of the egg is fine. Okay, condoms, diaphragms, these kinds of things. But once the egg is fertilized and a consciousness has entered, deliberately stopping the pregnancy is considered the destructive action of taking life. Situations such as the... Uh, as the child being born severely disabled or the mother's life being at stake needs special consideration. But His Holiness is not going to give a definitive answer on that one either. Although abortion in such cases still entails the taking of life, the motivation is different and usually involves regret and sadness making the karma lighter. But he's not saying it's karma-free. Overpopulation is a genuine concern in our world. As a society and as individuals, we must be responsible for the future of our planet. Birth control that prevents conception rather than terminates pregnancy is best. Giving a child up for adoption is another worthy option. My hope is that we can inculcate a sense of responsibility in young people and in adults too, so that they will use their sexuality wisely. Overestimating the value of romantic love and rushing into sexual relationships often leave people emotionally hurt or facing an unwanted pregnancy. Yeah, because, you know, your hormones take over, your attachment takes over, you don't think of the results of the action. Yeah, and then surprise. In general, we need to bring compassion to cases of unwanted pregnancy. Rather than judge and blame the people involved, we need to help them resolve the situation as best as possible. Okay. Then, I think this is a good place to stop.